And I'd actually like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands that we're all meeting um, from today, because we're from all over the country. So I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and acknowledge that these lands have always been places of learning and teaching and research. So welcome everybody. Um, hello, I am going to share my screen to kick off, but hopefully you can see everybody. It's lovely to see your faces um, because that just kind of makes it feel like we're really sitting and chatting with each other. But if you can't, if there's a reason why you can't have your camera on, that's totally fine as well. Um, I'm just bringing up your faces here and I'm also bringing up the chat. So I'm going to try and uh, watch the chat as well. So you are most welcome to uh, put some questions, ideas, thoughts, uh, responses, uh, stories in the chat as well. Um, but you are also uh, willing, uh, you're able to unmute as well. So let's kick off then. Uh, we've got a great group here today. Hi, Belinda. Lovely to see you. Um, tea and Buns. Tea and Buns, for any of, the, uh, any of you who don't know, is a monthly session where we get together and we have a yarn. We have a yarn about particular issues that are facing us as individuals, as teams, as organisations, or even as communities. So it's a way of just getting together and talking about life. And, and just to, I'm just going to move on, just to say that um, this conversation is being recorded because there are many people that uh, listen to the recording and can't always make it live. Um, so just so that, you're in the, uh, that you know and are aware of that. Um, and as I said, please use the chat box. That's a fantastic way to chat to each other, but you're also most welcome to come off mute as well. I don't want to do all the talking. Uh, you are here to ask questions and talk with Donna just as much as myself. Now, I do want to just um, tell you that this session is talking with Donna, and I'm so grateful for Donna to join us today and have a chat with us about resilience and mental health. But I do want to say that we probably will be talking about suicide as well. And so that's a little trigger warning. Um, if, uh, if at any stage you feel that, um, you know, there's a reason why you'd like to leave, um, no judgment and we won't be asking any questions. You're most welcome to just self-care if the conversation goes down a path that you feel, no, I'm not comfortable with that. So I just wanted to just put that out there. First of all, Donna is going to be talking about her own story um, and it does include a conversation about suicide. So, all right, are we okay with that? Right. Can we just say to Ruth that yes. if you are affected by the talk, can you please make sure that you reach out to somebody? Don't deal with that on your own. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But we're all very supportive here today. And um, this is mental health is something that we have to become more, com well, I believe, okay, my personal perspective is mental health is something that we have to become much more comfortable about talking about. And, uh, and we have to feel okay about being vulnerable, but we also, when we're listening to people talking about their mental health, we have to show empathy. So empathy is the name of the game today. And uh, we wanna just be really raw and real with each other. And we thank Donna for coming and talking to us about her story. But I thought we'd just kick off with a little sort of little icebreaker really. Um, one of the things I love talking to people about is seasons and how we're feeling as a, you know, as a season. Seasons uh, are very, uh, the, I grew up in England where the seasons were very distinct, okay, and so I was very used to growing up with summer and spring and autumn and winter and they were very distinctive uh, seasons and some of you maybe from the South Adelaide might know a little bit more about that in Queensland not so much um, but we all know what seasons are you know seasons are a change in the weather and I just thought I'd ask you what season are you in right now let's pop it in the chat where do you feel you are? Is it is it summer for you? Are things going really well? And, you know, the sun is out and you're feeling strong and, you know, joyful in your step? Or is it a little bit rainy? Are you kind of in autumn where you're feeling like, oh, you know, the rain and the cold is getting to you a little bit? Or maybe you're even in winter. Maybe there's some storms or some snow and you're feeling a little bit like, oh, this, oh, some of you love 
actually some of you might love winter i get that but how are you feeling right now let's see okay so some of you are in autumn winter midwinter yeah late winter early spring and i'm talking obviously you personally not really i'm talking about your feelings and how we can kind of express our feelings through this kind of analogy and i have to be honest with you donna and i'm going to be really real with you i'm sunflowers are my most loveliest flower i love sunflowers and i typically live in sunshine like my my outlook is try i try to be very joyful i try to be very positive i'm definitely a glass half full and uh, and i typically live in that space but the last week has actually been quite difficult for me uh, i've got a couple of deadlines going on at work that's been quite stressful uh, we start a new semester today actually and uh so i've been trying to prep ready for the new semester um there's been a lot of things going on this last couple of weeks and i don't feel like i'm in summer right now i feel like i'm going through a little bit of a storm but i think and and donna i'd love your thoughts on this you know when we think about seasons it's really good to remember that seasons don't last forever and I'm trying to remember that right now. I'm trying to say this will, you know, mm. in a couple of weeks when my deadlines are finished, when I'm in the flow of, of teaching, you know, I might get back to that sunshine again. Is that what you find, Donna? Yes, I, I really like that. I always get confused between metaphors and analogies. So please forgive me, but I do really like that metaphor of the seasons uh it makes a lot of sense and you know something I find myself talking about a lot when it comes to mental health and dealing with crises it's that recognition that everything that everything passes there is you know nothing is permanent and so you know it's all about um staying well and getting us through those those more challenging times those darker times stormy times absolutely so I don't know if you noticed I put in the chat that I feel like I'm in winter as well and what you described of yourself being very much a summer person that's me too but I feel like my winter hasn't been um my wintry mood hasn't so much been stormy as I feel like it's been a bit um a period of hibernation and um, maybe regeneration and, and preparation for the bloom that's coming. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm I'm looking forward to spring and and know that I'm moving into that now. And there are so many factors, aren't there, that actually affect how we feel and what season we're in. And uh, we have to really um, acknowledge that some of those things do trigger us and do sort of make us feel certain ways. So thanks, everybody. I just and thank you for sharing, um, you know, that we're all and, and, it, and it's, it's actually quite interesting to see that everybody's in a different place. And everybody's going through different things. And I think that's the first kind of insight to me is uh, we can't, you know, talk to someone and expect they're going to feel like us or that they're in the same place as us. You know, we have to recognise that everybody is going through different life circumstances, different challenges, um, different seasons for different reasons. And, and that's why I love the word empathy, because it's about just acknowledging where people are at. Mm -hmm. Oh, all right. Well, that's just got us chatting. Um, but I want to introduce Donna formally now and just welcome you, Donna. Thank you so much. Um, you've got an amazing story to tell. And um, for everybody that wants to see Donna's story in full, you can go and see a documentary that's been made about Donna. And, um, and I watched it a couple of weeks ago and was blown away by your story, Donna. Um, but you, you do have a lived experience of poor mm. mental health that really affected your life um, thankfully you're alive to tell the tale and 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 your life was saved and I wondered if you just to just to let us know a little bit about yourself can you give us a bit of insight into maybe the season that you went through and what happened because mm. of that and mm -hmm. um, and then what brought you through that to now be mm. the mental health advocate that you are today yeah, sure. Thanks, Ruth. 
Uh, <laughs> so uh, back in 2012, I'm, I'm a HR professional uh, going along in my career um, quite well. I, I actually had a two-year-old, so I, I've been back at work about a year and I was uh, tasked with a project. Uh, it was a change project in the organization. So I was involved in that project and leading a small team. And initially I wasn't sure that it was the right role for me. I actually, in hindsight, um, experienced uh, some feelings that um, indicated to me that like my intuition basically saying, I'm not sure this is right, but I appreciated that management believed in me and that I had this opportunity and I agreed to take it on and uh, and it went along fine for a little while and then I actually had an argument with somebody who was working for me at work and it was in you know the open plan office where everyone can hear everything and I felt really embarrassed and I um I found myself really doubting myself as a leader and I for years as a HR professional had been coaching managers on how to be better leaders and all of a sudden I just thought oh my gosh I'm, I must be great at this like I'm, I'm a terrible leader this doesn't happen if you know what you're doing and these thoughts then just started um, like my thoughts started spiraling and I started seeing everything through this lens of um, maybe you're not very good and now everyone's finding out about it and my thoughts just got sort of darker and darker and and really just I unraveled and fairly quickly as well I would say um, like a week 10 days the the height of this experience uh, was and yeah so I would walk away from interactions with people thinking oh you know they, they think you don't know what you're doing um, they can tell that you're failing and instead of reaching out which in hindsight is what we need to do uh, I kept it to myself because I felt like it would be broadcasting that I was failing and uh, it was bad enough that I knew it um, and so ultimately I got to a point where I didn't um, I felt like I couldn't stay at work and then I felt like I was going to be a sad for my job and I had been there six over 16 years 16 and a half years and I had an excellent uh, performance record but my thoughts had got quite irrational and I got to a point where I I thought that I would be a bad role model to my son if I was to be dismissed from my job and that my family would be better off without me so there, there were many steps sort of in there many other factors but um this is a quick pray to you so uh ultimately I decided that the only way I could uh fix this mess that I'd created was to yeah and from the 12th of August uh 2012 I left from the story bridge with that intention and surprisingly to me I woke up in the Royal Brisbane Hospital uh, quite a few hours later and uh, yeah it was not what I expected at all and fortunately for me over the sort of next couple of days I decided that I must be meant to be here if, if that if I had survived that experience and yeah, from then embarked on a journey to uh, make sure it never happened again and ultimately to learn um, or discover how I might use this experience to help others so that other people don't have to look at the road. So I had a lot of physical injury, but uh, ultimately it was working on my, my mind and my mindset and introducing well-being strategy that really changed my life. So Donna, listening to your story, it sounds like a lot of what was happening for you was that sort of blame or guilt or, you know, it was it was mm, you shame. talking to yourself. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Shame, guilt, blame. I'm a bad person, not that I've done a bad thing or that I'm, you know, it's I personalized it so very yeah, and, that and it be, wasn't even rational. Yeah, so it can be so powerful when we talk to ourselves, can't it? Oh, totally. Um, yeah, 
and mm. uh, we have to be really be quite mindful of the way that we're talking to ourselves. Mm. And okay. also you said, you know, um, you found it hard to reach out and ask for help. Mm. Why was yeah. that? Why couldn't you actually talk to someone and say, help, you know, I'm, I'm not feeling in a good way? Yeah, yeah, as I just mentioned, I, I think mostly it was that I, I didn't want to admit that I was failing. I didn't want other people to know that. I felt embarrassed by it. Um, and, yeah, that it just it felt too scary to do that. And, you know, I, I can certainly see now the importance of that and the fact, you know, one of my favourite scenes comes from uh, apparently Marie Folio's mother, uh, everything is figure outable. You know, back then I, I had lost sight of that. It was like, I don't know how to fix this. And I'm quite an, um, I think, quite a determined and quite an independent person as well, which can be wonderful. But I, I think the, you know, the flip side of that is that sometimes um, that actually can make life harder and it's important that we do reach out. And I think from my own my own experience is that we we want to be perceived as professional and leaders and got it all together and you know coping well and when we feel that people are not going to see that then we 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 just hide it to ourselves because we don't we we want people to have that perception that we've got it all together and we're doing well and we're staying positive and and when that's not happening yeah we can really criticize ourselves and not want to share that with anybody yeah totally thank you donna for just introducing ourselves um to you is there any questions you want to ask donna just to just from that, although we are going to move into a few other questions now about Donna's work in terms of supporting us to think about our mental health. Is there is there any questions for Donna at this point? It's an amazing story, isn't it, that she has? Okay. Well, I thought that we would maybe frame some questions around four key areas. Um, I really want to talk to you, Donna, about workplace well-being. Um, most of us are working or we are, you know, we're looking for work or we're in work or we may have actually lost our job, um, but we want to talk about workplace well-being and, and really then the impact of the pandemic. How has that affected well-being? What are your, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I really want to get to some practical tools and strategies because we're all here. We want to learn some really good things that we can do to maintain our mental health. Um, mm. And then you talk a lot about mental health literacy. So maybe if we can get to that and then really talk mm. about, well, what is mental health literacy? What does it mean? And how can we not only obviously have that ourselves but how can we help our team because we're all working with teams and it's incredibly important I believe um, that we all share that literacy with each other so that we can support each other is that okay is that a good way of um, framing some questions all right. Well, as I said, everybody, you're most welcome to share uh, your questions either in the chat or just unmute, but I'm going to kick off. All right. Because I've got a heap of questions here. <laughs> Hit me with them, Ruth. Uh, okay. Well, I'm going to kick off um, really about um, organizations and learning from our story. So you've just mm. shared an incredibly amazing and very vulnerable story about your own mental health. Why is there a good reason for sharing stories in the workplace? Mm. I mean, I've said it's not always easy. You feel a bit vulnerable. You know, what what can workplaces learn from stories like yourself? Yeah. Look, I, I think it's so critical to normalize mental health that if we can uh, do that we can reduce the stigma and you know people can actually have that confidence to reach out when they're struggling to know that they're not the only one I mean I just noticed uh, someone said in the chat uh, the story really resonates you know the number of people who have reached out to me and said oh my gosh I've been where you've been um, you know I didn't take it to the next step or I'm there now, what can I do? You know, we are not unique in having these experiences. Uh, we know that 45% of Australians experience a mental illness over the course of their lifetime. And these are pre-COVID statistics. Um, and, you know, we, it, we can influence this. If we have these conversations, 
uh, we can help people to not feel alone. You know, I think that's so important. And the organisation that I work for, they have done some amazing work uh, since my um, uh, my crisis. Uh, I wasn't alone. They actually had a, a, a more than one of um, type of situation occur. And they've now got in place mental health advocates. Um, they handled my case so beautifully. Like they... Um, I was visited by my group manager in the hospital, in the mental health unit. My privacy was maintained uh, so well that I felt I could go back and continue my career in that organisation. So, you know, if we can um, support staff who, who go through these experiences, whether it, you know, be a crisis or even just you know, an, an early or emerging mental health problem, we can really make a difference to their lives, you know, their ability to, you know, be a, a productive and engaged employee, but also the culture of the organisation. And, and I think that one of the fears that people have is that they're going to lose their job or they're not going to be as respected if they share a story that they're not feeling too well. Um, yeah. How do, how do workplaces make sure that that fear doesn't stop people from sharing stories? Yeah. Look, I think um, leaders uh, being vulnerable and sharing some of their own stories uh, can be really powerful. I've seen this in uh, a bunch of different businesses. One of the organisations I've uh, done some work with, SEQ Water, they had me speak on a panel a couple of years ago and they during Safe Work Month, focused on mental health. And they had a, a, a leader and another staff member record a video of their experience uh, with mental illness. And you know, particularly leaders doing this can help people to see that they're not alone, that this is a safe place to do this. Um, and it, it's quite leading from the front, you know, in terms of influencing the culture. Yeah, great. So we talk a lot about sort of workplace health and safety. And of course, over the years, um, you know, that's now come into kind of bullying when, I'm, you know, bullying is part of um, workplace health and safety or reducing yeah. that and avoiding that. Um, so we're, we're sort of health and health um, and safety in the workplace is not just about tripping over leads anymore. OK, or making sure we don't hurt ourselves physically. Yeah. There is a move to the idea that we also have a responsibility to to support people's mental health. What do yeah. you think about that? Do you think it's mm. the, the responsibility of the organisation to make sure mm. that, you know, we're mentally well? Or, or do we have our own choice and responsibility yeah. in that as well? Yeah, good question, Ruth. Um, so, I, I mean, the legislation is such now that it picks up psychological safety and physical safety. So, in my opinion, you know, we've done so much on the physical hazards. You know, we've made amazing advances as a, a nation. And to me, mental health is the next frontier of safety. And, and it's time that we, we looked at this. So uh, under the Workplace Health and Safety Act, employers have an obligation to provide a um, both a um, physically, a, like, like a safe and healthy workplace, including psychological safety. So it's actually a, a requirement, uh, but it's also a good business and and morally appropriate, I think. I think individuals do have a responsibility here, just like they do with, you know, physical safety. Um, we all have a lot of influence over our personal safety, over our, our mental health. Uh, and we, we probably have the greatest degree of influence over it. So um, I think it's important that we acknowledge that and we are always uh, doing the best that we can. We are the author of our own lives. Uh, but I also think that organisations have a responsibility to not harm their employees, to uh, create an environment where they can uh, go home to their families uh, safe and um, and well. Uh, so, you know, looking at things like the psychosocial hazards that um, might be created by the workplace through things like job design or um, workload. Uh, you know, it's important that organisations look at that. 
uh, as I said, 45% of us experience a mental illness. So it's going to exist in workplaces. It's inevitable. So how do you make sure that you don't, I guess, aggravate uh, those injuries in the way that you uh, structure the work or the culture that you have? Um, as a mental health first aid instructor, I, I talk in the course about uh, the definition of a mentally healthy workplace and that's one where there is a positive culture that uh, risks to mental health are minimized and that uh, discrimination is not tolerated so you, you know I think as workplaces that's something that we should all be uh, if not currently achieving certainly aspiring towards yeah, Christina's just picked up and, and Stacey and an important point, I think, here about when we're trying to create these work uh, healthy workplaces and somebody does feel able to share with us, you know, they're not coping very well or they're under a bit of stress or they're not happy with change or whatever it might be. If we're not equipped with being able to listen mm. and show empathy, then actually we can shut down the conversation very quickly, can't we? So uh, what is the role of empathy? And I know Leanne is online, I think. Um, the empathy works, queen. The empathy guru around here, yes. um, teaching people about empathy. But I, I'd like mm. to hear from your perspective, you know, how mm. can we as colleagues, as leaders, how can we uh, encourage these conversations without shutting them down or feeling mm. embarrassed when people say, look, actually, I'm quite stressed at the moment. Yes. Look, I think one of the most powerful life skills and definitely leadership skills is to be able to listen, to be able to hold a space, to be able to sit with somebody with whatever they are going through, whatever that is. And, and really that's, oh, it would be great to hear Leanne's definition of empathy, but to me that that's what empathy is, being able to sit with somebody in their emotions, um, and be able to support them through that. And we might never have been through what they're going through, but we have likely experienced the emotion that, that they're experiencing right now. And so being able to just tap into that, being able to like hold that space for them is incredible. And, and I really do believe that all of us are looking to be um seen and heard and felt, um, sorry, seen and heard and loved in life. You know, that to be able to do that for another human being is amazing. But the effect that it can have for somebody in terms of them feeling connected and uh, feeling seen in life is amazing. And it's not just about saying, oh, gosh, I know how you feel. Uh, no. I've gone through that too. Just do this, 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 and you'll be fine, isn't yes. it? Uh, because many of us um, here today are from, you know, community services that love to solve problems. Yes. Uh, we, we're very quick at wanting to be able to rescue, not and rescue may be the wrong word, but support people, but, you know, find solutions really quickly and say, just do this mm. or just do that or try and uh try and uh say well I felt like that too once you know so how do we mm. make sure that we don't jump into that and believe yeah. that's empathy because that's not empathy mm. yeah no that's not it's it really does come down to that listening and being able to do that really well so um I don't know if uh, everyone in the room is aware of Oscar Trimboli's book Deep Listening that, that's a book I'd really encourage people to take a look at it's only a short book actually and he's got a podcast as well if you're looking to enhance your listening skills um great great um techniques that he talks about so that just uh, zipping your lips what's the name of that book again donna so deep listening deep listening okay. yeah um it's human nature that we feel uncomfortable comes with silence that we want to talk and as you just pointed out we, we want to solve somebody if we feel like we can we want to solve their problem if we feel like we can help but what we really need to do is actually um, zip our lips and um, just ask some uh, open-ended questions and what will happen is if we can be silent that discomfort with silence can often lead to them actually opening up because they'll, you know, that uh, they'll feel the silence that feels awkward for people. Um, 
just um, those minimal encouragers, those um, or tell me more and even aha, uh -huh, mm, leaning in, um, eye contact, uh, but maybe not too much eye contact. You know, there's lots of little techniques that we can use and Oscar talks about a bunch of these things um, in his book. But uh, I would say one of the most important aspects of it too is just being present. Like when the Thanks, Tanya. Tanya's put in some links. I love people who uh, help out with that. Um, Leanne, you're most welcome to put in your link to your podcast yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, Leanne does um, a podcast on empathy. Um, and, and in actual fact, that's reminded me that empathy is not just great for our, our own teams, but it's actually good for the way that we work with our clients and our service users as well. <laughs> So we mustn't forget that, you know, that empathy is a great skill for working with anyone who's talking to us and expressing how they're feeling and, yeah. I think it's connection. important as well to do, to really quick, can I give the three definitions of empathy? Because a lot of people yes. will be oh, thinking, yeah. em okay, so let me jump in. Hello, I'm Leanne. I run Empathy First. Um, so the three definitions of empathy to make sure we're all talking about the same thing is emotional empathy is you're sad, I'm sad, we're all sad together, I then need to regroup from my sadness and I can burn out if I'm feeling your sadness and your sadness and everything else. So that can lead to burnout. So we need to practice self-care. So that's emotional empathy. We're not really talking about that one. Cognitive empathy, which Ruth just said is, oh, I know how you feel. I've been through that too. My sister lost a baby. Like, Whatever it is, you go, no, no, you're making a lot of assumptions in that piece. So cognitive empathy is not really where it's at. That's not where you build connection. Um, it's compassionate empathy. So the ability to share and understand the feelings of another person and respond appropriately. So it's that what we were just talking about, the listening and the sitting and the being present and the eye contact and the open questions and the hug, if you can, um, but that's the, that's the really key piece of empathy that we talk about, compassionate empathy. So you're still sharing, and the only way to share and understand someone's feelings is to listen to their feelings, not make assumptions, judgment, expectation, all that sort of stuff. So when we talk about empathy in this space, it's all compassionate empathy. We're not asking you to go, oh, I need to feel your feelings, and I need to feel your feelings, and I need to feel your feelings. Um, yeah. So self-care is a big part of empathy because that's part of responding appropriately. Awesome. Oh, Thanks, music. Leanne. Thank you, Leanne. Um, <laughs> I want to sort of take that then and talk about the pandemic real quick because mm. for me the pandemic has really brought a lot of emotions up for a lot of people and it is a conversation that we're having personally on social media, um, on the TV, we're watching, we're watching it every night. You know, there is a lot of people talking about the pandemic and what's going on. And I feel like we're on a roller coaster at the moment. And I know some of you are just coming out of lockdown. Some of you are going into lockdown. Um, it, it, it wasn't that kind of very, you know, back 18 months ago, we thought, oh, this was just going to be a couple of months and then we'll be through it. And it's definitely not been like that. And we really can't see the end yet in sight either. So how do we make sure... Donna, that we, we're, we're maintaining our mental health through this roller coaster of, you know, mm. the pandemic, whatever that's, that means to us. Yeah, yeah, sure is. Um, yeah. I'm going to be really honest and tell you that when we were in lockdown last year, they, they were tough days for me. I, I went through a period sort of at the height of it a few weeks where I struggled quite considerably even though I would classify myself as thriving and I have a very large toolkit of resilience strategies um, some things that I, I do do uh, to help me manage the situation is I limit the uh, media exposure that I have. Um, I actually, that, that's pretty much how I operate all the time. And so I figure if something is really uh, important for me to know, someone's going to tell me, or if um, I need to know if, where we're at at lockdown, I'll Google it or whatever. Um, but, you know, we can go on and we, we can really take on that energy, that negativity bias that the media has. So I think... Um, being really careful that's important um, maybe having a reputable source that you refer to at 
a certain time of day with something rather than um, having it in the background all the time. Uh, the other thing I'd say is just looking for ways to be connected, okay? Like we're, we're so fortunate to have Zoom, aren't we? Imagine doing this. Imagine when that last pandemic hit, you know, we, we're we really lucky, you know, lots of people are having, um, you know, online catch-ups with people, even, you know, having eating the same meal or drinking the same wine, that sort of thing. I think that's really important. Um, and moving our body and depending on what your lockdown restrictions are, um, you know, finding something like, like even when we're in lockdown here, we've been able to go for a walk. I know that's not the case for everybody. Uh, and so I'll do things like walk up and down the back stairs, you know, use whatever I've got at my disposal. Uh, I know I, I did, uh, I talked on this a little bit at the height of the pandemic and, and we're asking other people about their strategies and people were saying um, yoga with Ariana, I think this woman's name was, you know, like, how lucky are we to have YouTube and what we have access to there, you know? So I think um, recognising, um, you, you know, what strategies work for you or exploring um, and then making sure that you do these things, that you incorporate them into your routine. So if that means blocking time in your diary, um, that's important. Uh, I've worked with a lot of people over the last year who are telling me, that they're not taking breaks, that, uh, you know, they're, they're in lockdown or they're working from home. And that time that they would previously have been commuting, you know, maybe it's 45 minutes, morning and afternoon, they're actually sitting at their computer and yeah. working in that time. And then they're feeling like, you know, they're trying to juggle all these things. Maybe the kids are at home and, and then they're just working through their breaks because they're feeling that under the palm. But what the research tells us is that we're actually better off stopping, taking a break, even if it's a 10-minute break, to go out to the backyard, to ground yourself, like being in nature uh, can make a really big difference. These sort of things can shift our energy and they will make us more productive. The research tells us that's the case. So, um, you know, it's an investment. Often people think of it as an expense, but it's actually an investment. Um, there are so many different things that we can be doing to maintain our mental health. And, you know, so often people say to me, but I don't have time for this well-being stuff. You know, <laughs> to me, again, it's, it's an investment. It's capacity building. Um, but also, there are so many different strategies you can do in no time at all. You know, one of a favourite that I have heard and sometimes use is checking in with yourself in the morning in the mirror. Like, how are you today? Just being in your body, being present, and just saying to yourself, well, "What do you need? How can I help you today?" You know, um, one of my favourite practices. Um, oh. I, I think we're going to talk about practices later, but I have a gratitude practice where myself and four people text each other three gratitudes a day. It's been going over four years. It, it was life-changing, this practice. Um, you know, we've got that part of our brain, the reticulator activating system. It tunes in to whatever we pay attention to. So when you start paying attention to what's great in your life, which might even be just being able to have a hot shower or a cold shower or, um, you know, somebody letting us in the checkout queue and all of these little things, our brain will look for more of those things. It's like the when you're going to buy a blue mask, all of a sudden you see them everywhere. They were always there. That's what happens with gratitude. So I love gratitude. It's got some beautiful research behind it as well. Yeah. Absolutely. And you can easily do that from lockdown, you know, you get a couple of mates together or family members. Can everybody share something that's worked for them? I'd love to know if there is a strategy that you have been using that has been a positive thing for you. Perhaps put it in the chat. Um because I think sharing ideas of strategies is really um, helpful. And um, the one thing I'll share is that often in the middle of the day, I will take a shower because I'm at home, obviously. My, I'm, I'm still working from home a lot. And you're right, Donna, I can sort of get the kids off and it's all a buzz mm. trying to get the kids off to school. And then I'm straight into thinking about what I need to do for work. And sometimes I can even avoid um, having that early shower. Um, so then when I feel stressed or I feel like, hang on a minute, I've been just I've just gone straight to my emails and I'm, I'm just getting straight into work and I haven't even 
I haven't even thought about myself and getting myself prepared for the day. That's when I then go, no, stop. I need to go off and have a shower and really just think about my day and being grateful. Actually, that's another thing I do just in the shower, just sort of talking about what's going well. You know, what is this day going to be achievable for me? You know, what can I achieve in this day? What's what's oh, and by the way, music. Thank you uh, yeah. for anybody that favorite. doesn't. But music is great. And tea and buns at Christmas, we all put together a, uh, a Spotify list. So if you go to Spotify and search for tea and buns playlist, you will find that everybody in tea and buns put together their favorite energizing songs. And I put it up on Spotify um, so that you can just use that to have a dance, to put on in the morning, um, to just, you know, when you're feeling a bit, you know, put on some energizing music, have a dance around. Don't care what your kids think. They laugh at me, but I don't care what they think. And it's just really good to get that body moving, isn't it? All right. Oh, great. Everybody's sharing some great things about what they're doing. Oh, wow. Yes. 22 new messages. I yeah. love that there's so much diversity, you know, and it's about finding what works for you and having a beautiful big toolkit of them. I think um, the most important thing I'd say around this, um, you know, the practices, Ruth, is that we have to get them into our routine. They, they only yeah. work if we routinize them. Uh, you know, often people, when they get busy, they'll drop this stuff even though they know it's good for them but that's when you need it the most right so it's got to be part of your routine yeah absolutely I think walking and going outside and doing a 30 minute walk that can again be something that we know is good for us but you know when life is happening and everything's busy uh that can be the thing that we think oh no I don't have time to go out for a walk today or I don't have time to go and do that exercise class yeah that's really important Okay. Oh, great. Thanks, everybody, for sharing. Has anybody got any questions for Donna before I continue with a couple more questions before we sort of um, think about mental health literacy? Plants, (laughs) gardening. I just love mowing the lawn, actually. I'm I'm no gardener, but I do love mowing the lawn. (laughs) I don't know why, but that helps me. It looks beautiful when we've done it. And the smell, I just love the smell yeah. of the fresh cut grass. So we've got a few more minutes and I really would like, now these are all great tips. Um, maybe you could tell us then, you know, in regards to mental health literacy, what does that mean? And what does that mean in terms of these practical strategies that you think will help us continue um, to help us with our mental health? Yeah, cool, Ruth. Um, so you, you, with, when it comes to the mental health literacy, I think that it is so important for every single one of us to have a, a degree of mental health awareness. <laughs> We, we need to be able to recognise the signs that someone is struggling, including ourselves. So knowing what happens in our body when we're stressed, um, knowing, uh, you know, when our thinking is actually, um, you know, turning to the negative side, you know, when we're losing perspective on something, we need to be able to identify those signs. Um, you know, when it comes to, the signs and symptoms in the workplace, you know, things like uh, seeing an, a, a colleague withdrawing or, or perhaps a, a team member or a subordinate, um, noticing changes in their demeanour. It's so important as leaders that you know your people, that you can tell when something's going on for them, but that you also have the relationship needed to be able to engage them in a conversation because if you don't have that relationship it's going to be difficult for you to do that and it may not be well received by them either so uh, learning about mental health is critical understanding what it's all about that it's you know that it's um that it's no different from having a physical injury or illness you know I look forward to a time when we don't distinguish between mental and physical health. They're just health. 
But right now we've got a lot of catching up to do. So courses like, you know, mental health first aid, uh, obviously I'm a trainer and I'm, I'm probably could be perceived as being biased, but there's a reason I became a mental health trainer. I feel really passionate about people developing the skills and confidence to be able to have a conversation with somebody, to be able to uh help guide them to getting some support that can get them back on track really quickly. Because what we know is that 65% of people with a common mental illness don't actually go and get help, but they're far more likely to get help if somebody they know suggests it. So, you know, I think everyone needs to have a degree of awareness and um, an, an idea of the key skills. So, you know, mental health first aid teaches a framework where um, you can um, it can guide a conversation with somebody. Are you okay? Have some amazing resources uh, for conversations and referrals as well. But one of the key skills is that listening skill. You know, if if uh, if you don't remember anything else when it comes to having a well-being conversation with somebody listening can make such a difference people can actually experience a shift just yeah. as they process what's going on by articulating it so you know my recommendation to all organizations is to um get some mental health awareness happening in your organization uh, start talking about it. Uh, if you're not already, we want to normalize it. You want to reduce stigma, um, introduce um, a mental health uh, policy or at least a guideline in your organization. Start thinking about, uh, if you're not already, uh, psychosocial hazards, you know, uh, safe work in Queensland. And I know that uh, there's also uh, federal equivalents. Uh, they have... Um, resources uh, toolkit where you can conduct your own uh, psychosocial hazard audit um, you know look at things like your staff survey what are your staff telling you you know do you have a psychologically safe workplace one where people can uh, feel uh, where there's a high degree of trust where people can feel that it safe to talk about what's on their mind you know that their leader feels like a safe person that the culture feels positive um yeah, yeah. Well, I think Donna you're actually answering a little bit about a question from Belinda who said mm -hmm. you know what would have helped you when things were spiraling out of control and mm -hmm. I think you're kind of answering that in a way and sort of explaining that if somebody had noticed, maybe somebody could have just sat down and listened to you and said, how are you feeling or what's happening? Or yeah. did that look like, you know, you, that that didn't look like a great situation for you. You know, it was, is that true? Am I, am I reading that right? Yes. Look, I think um, what I was struggling and uh, my boss did attempt a conversation with me. So I had an acting boss at the time, but somebody that I knew reasonably well uh he had no appreciation of sort of the gravity of the situation and I didn't give a lot away. And that always is a challenge if somebody um, doesn't give a lot away, as, as often will happen. What I really recommend people do is get comfortable asking the question, are you having any thoughts of ending your life? While I was still at work, I hadn't reached that point, but a few days later I had. Nobody who knew me would ever have imagined that I was suicidal. Um, I was, you know, as we talked about earlier, like summer, like, you know, enthusiastic, uh, friendly, um, probably people would say bubbly, but I wasn't at that point. I uh, was withdrawn. I was uh, confused. I... Um, yeah, I was very much in my head. I wasn't sleeping well. And so these signs indicate that somebody's struggling. And asking the question about suicide is very, it, it saves people's lives. People we are mustn't often be afraid of saying that. We mustn't we need to get mustn't comfortable. Be afraid. Yeah. We and it doesn't make people think, oh, yes, actually, I could you know, go and end my life. It's about it's about putting those questions in that allows somebody to go, actually, 
maybe not yet or I'm yes you know so it's it's about not being afraid of saying that genuinely um and yes. empathetically yeah and even saying look I'm I'm, I'm even feeling, I'm feeling slightly uncomfortable saying this, but I really care about you. And I can see some signs that um, are sometimes associated with suicidal thoughts. Are you having any thoughts of ending your life? Um, the more comfortable we can get uh, with asking this question, the safer our, our community and workplaces are going to be. Uh, I feel like I would have said yes if I was asked that question because I'm pretty transparent and uh, I think most people by nature don't lie. Uh, so it, the research tells us that it will not put the idea into anyone's head and it saves people's lives. And I can tell you, I have asked this question so many times of family members, of friends. I was on the phones at Lifeline for four and a half years and pretty much we were required to ask that question every call. Um, sometimes I would ask that question where there were no flags for suicide and someone would say, oh, my gosh, yes, I am, and it would blow my mind. In all the times I've asked, which would be more than hundreds, it would be in the hundreds, uh, nobody has got angry at me. I had a friend uh, laugh once when I asked her, I knew she was going through a lot of challenges, relationship um, breakdown, uh, estranged from her son who she adored. And I was like, what's funny about that? And she said, oh, my GP just asked me that question this morning. Um, yeah. So I encourage you, get used to it. Uh, I have a contact in my network who, uh, in his management meeting, he's a CEO and he uh, has everybody break up into pairs and practice asking the question to build muscle memory about it. And, and I, I, I think I applaud that and encourage you to think. So Donna, we've got time for one more question. And Steve has just uh, said, you know, yeah, this is about when people do have poor mental health. So what's your one sort of favourite tip to give us if we're doing okay right now and we don't want to get to that stage? Yes. What's, your, what's your one favourite tip to give people about resilience and, and staying mm. mentally well? Yes. Um, look, I, I think we really need to be thriving. And it, the, the great thing is if we're thriving and we hit a challenge, we sort of slip back into that surviving mode. If we're sitting in surviving, which many people actually are, then we're at much greater risk of falling back into that um, into that um, struggling zone. So, yes, look, I actually became an accredited uh, workplace resilience trainer because I love mental health first aid, but I want to see us operating in the proactive space so that less people end up down here. There are so many practices. I mean, I use a, a journal uh, daily at the moment. I've been doing that pretty consistently for a year. I have times of uh, being um, just present. So um, a mindfulness practice, um, just tuning in to what's going on around me uh, regularly in the day. Uh, there, there are just so many strategies and it's about finding the ones that work for you as well. So I really uh, advocate, agree with what somebody said about asking around other people's strategies. I think there's things we can do in the workplace, having a gratitude board where we acknowledge people. Um, lots of the strategies that I talk about, uh, one of the ones I share in my keynote is help one person every day. Now there's research that tells us that if we do something um, kind for somebody else, they're likely to pay a forward even more than twice. And so we can create a ripple effect with these activities. So educating people at work about this, leading uh, these types of strategies can help create um, more of a thriving workplace and thriving yeah. team. Uh, Next Friday, I'm actually running a resilience mini workshop from I think it's 11 to 12.30. Yes. So I run those, I offer those every six to eight weeks and I talk to people about the resilience at work framework. And it's the, the definition that we use for resilience is that it is about, uh, it's about uh, handling the everyday stresses of uh, work, being able to learn from setbacks, but 
most importantly, be able to prepare for future challenges. And there is a model uh, that we use, a framework, and it uh, helps people to understand that resilience is actually not just self-care. It's, it's an element of it, but there are a bunch of different levers that we have for our resilience. Things like uh, our, using our strength and aligning our values to our work, having a sense of purpose at work, maintaining perspective through knowing about uh, the different uh, mind traps that can exist, uh, putting um, routines around our self-care strategies, being connected with people, being able to reach out for help and being able to give help to others. So I love this model. Because so, yeah, I think everybody should come along to your resilience yes. workshop and yes. learn more about resilience. That's brilliant. Yeah. Cool. Uh, my um, one tip, and to finish with this, is um, that I think that in team meetings you should always start off with good news stories. Uh, I, I have seen so many people who have team meetings and they just forget to talk about the good news stuff. And um, and, and that's, uh, that's a real shame because I think it always starts off a, a meeting in a, in a positive way if you can say what's going well, even if it's about your own personal life, you know, just going around and sharing what's going well. Okay, so, um, yes, please, Donna, share your information about your mm. workshop. There's other Why things. Why do you want me to do that? You can either pop it, pop it in the um, the chat here now, but okay. I also will put it on the blog as well when I put up the recording. Uh, there's a couple of other things that QUT are doing as well um, that work, are free things that people can come along to. So I'll, I'll pop that up uh, on the blog as okay. well. Great. Um, can we all say thank you to Donna today for coming along and sharing your story? Thank you so much, Donna. It's just, it feels good just to talk about this stuff and really just share each other's um, strategies and you know, know that there's hope because Donna, you have a wonderful story of, you know, recovery and now what you're doing with your life is, is helping others and, and we really appreciate that. So thank you mm. so much. Thank you. And I hope people connect with Donna more. Yeah, um, link, join, um, connect with me on LinkedIn. Link, LinkedIn is the platform that I mostly play on. So I yeah, share great. All right. information Everybody and resources. Link with you there. Fantastic. And you have a great website um, with some resources and stuff like that. So that's yeah. cool. and don't forget so, to watch um, the story on the, on the documentary. Yes, you can uh, jump on my website, um, www.donnaspeaks.com.au. Um, yeah. Donna I'll go away and um, put the link in. Right. I'll go grab the link for the resilience workshop. I won't be so. So thanks everybody for coming today. Um, I do want to let you know that we are going to continue having tea and buns for the second half of this year. The day may change. I start my lecturing has changed to a Thursday and um, that means it's going to be a little bit difficult for me to do team buns on a Thursday. So I just want you to know that I'm probably going to have to change the day um, and I hope that fits with everybody. I hope that's okay and it fits with your schedule. So just keep an eye on the emails. I'll be sending that out soon, but we've already got some great speakers planned for the next few months. So I'm really excited about how we can continue this conversation conversation. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Have a wonderful day. I hope you're feeling energised and, and mm. unable to go out and have a fantastic day and care about people. Just make someone smile today. And don't forget to put on some great music and have a bit of a dance around tonight, okay? All right. See you, folks.